Back in 2003, I was working in a tiny rural hospital in what felt like the middle of nowhere in South Africa. I was working as a clinical dietitian. I had a patient who was about three years old. His name was Temba. It wasn't the first time he'd come in. Temba had been admitted for severe malnutrition. When he came to the hospital, he was extremely thin, dehydrated, and he had skin lesions all over his body. He was so ill to the point that when they put up a drip to rehydrate him, he didn't even complain. When we put a feeding tube down his throat to refeed him, he hardly moved. But the power of nutrition is amazing. We started him on a very carefully calculated treatment to refeed him and re-nourish him. And within no time at all, he started making progress. That really cheeky character that I knew him for started to come back. And before we knew it, he was the boss of the pediatric ward. He ruled that place like it was his own kingdom. I even remember very, very fondly coming into the pediatric ward every morning to do my ward round with the doctors. And he'd stand at the edge of his cot, arms spread out like this, and he'd look at me and he'd go, Yay, wena! And that in Zulu, if you don't speak Zulu, it's a local African language, means, hello, you, except with a little bit more passion and aggression when he did it. And that's exactly what I used to say to him every morning when I'd go and see him and see how he was doing. I'd tickle him under his arm and try and get some sort of a smile, some sort of a response. So you can imagine when he was shouting that to me every morning, knew that he was making progress. And he spent the majority of the ward round perched on my hip, playing incessantly with a multicolored pen around my neck, or playing with the curls in my hair because I had quite the afro back then. Long story. <laughs> the problem is, although he recovered that time and we sent him home healthy and on his road to recovery, Temba had been in before for malnutrition. And there is what's called the first 1,000 day window. And this is when a mother falls pregnant right up until her child's second birthday. That first 1,000 days presents a lifetime opportunity to intervene when a child is growing and developing. And if a child is, or, or his or her mother at that time is malnourished in that 1,000 day window, they will or might never achieve their physical and cognitive potential as adults. It's literally a once in a lifetime opportunity that in Timber's case was missed. I still work in nutrition today and have the good fortune and I'm really excited that I work for a company and lead a very passionate and dedicated group of people. And our role today is to develop nutrition solutions that treat vitamin and mineral deficiencies, mainly in developing countries. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies or micronutri micronutrient deficiencies, or as we also call it in our industry, hidden hunger, is a very, very serious part of malnutrition. But the reason that I and my team love what we do is because we know beyond any doubt that the work we do in improving nutrition has benefits way beyond nutrition. Benefits actually that lead right up to the economic performance of an entire country. And I'll explain to you how. A research that was done back in Guatemala in 1969, so before I was born and definitely before any of you were born, this guy's name is John Horinot. He did a long-term study. He intervened with a group of preschool children and they did three main things. They gave them deworming medication, they gave them micronutrient supplements, and they gave them more nutritious food. And they compared that intervention group with a control group. And they followed them up for 35 years. At the end of that study, the high-level results were basically three main things that are takeaways for me. The kids that they intervened with stayed in school longer, and as adults, they were smarter, and they were earning higher salaries. So what we see here is a direct link between intervention and nutrition, especially early on in life, and economic outcomes for them as adults. There's actually studies that prove nutrition or malnutrition is directly responsible for several percentage points GDP loss or gain in countries. That's absolutely amazing. Nutrition has the potential to change gross domestic products of a country. There's a group of researchers as well in Europe called the Copenhagen Consensus Center, and I love these guys for what they do. They are passionate scientists, mathematical modelers, and what they've done several times is they bring leading economists, health economists, Nobel laureates together, and I like to think they put them in a little room and they ask them a question. If we had $75 billion to give to you, 
to solve the world's most pressing developmental problems, what would you focus on? What would you prioritize? I'm glad I didn't get asked that question because that's quite a question to ask and quite a budget to spend. $75 billion. So they did their modeling, they reviewed the research, they looked over it again and again and again. And then they rank the various interventions from the most priority down to the least. The good news for me and for nutrition is that nutrition in any form, whether it's micronutrient supplementation or increasing agricultural yields or access to clean, safe drinking water or promotion of breastfeeding, always comes out at or near the top. In other words, what they say is that investing in nutrition yields the highest return on investment. For every one dollar that you put into nutrition, you get the highest social return back. Now, if I'm a government deciding on how to allocate budgets, or I'm a donor, like the Bill Gates Foundation, deciding who to fund, whose programs to fund, or I'm an NGO trying to branch out of my areas of speciality and figure out what to do next in social development. Nutrition, for me, seems like a fantastic bet. We can link nutrition directly to economic outcomes. So this sounds great, and I know that because this is the field that I work in. But here's the problem. People who don't work in nutrition don't understand that. And nutrition is a complicated subject. It ranges right from, as I've said, supplements to fad diets to caring for the elderly and their nutritional needs, nutrition and health and disease. It's such a big topic. We know it as nutritionists, but decision makers don't always understand. And we struggle as nutrition community members to explain the potential of nutrition in a different way. And if we're going to have any hope of getting this message out there, we have to learn to talk about nutrition in a different way. We have to learn to engage with different stakeholders in a completely different language, break down barriers and bring that message in a way that people care about, in a way that resonates with them, and really in a way that they understand and connect to. Now I want to draw an interesting example. I have a banana here. And in fact, a, a colleague of mine gave me one this morning. It was really tiny. So it wouldn't have really proven my point. So I've got a normal sized banana. And if I said to you, eat this banana, it's, it's good for you, it's nutritious. You might, if you like bananas, although I'm a stranger, so you probably wouldn't because you're told not to talk to strangers and especially accept things from strangers. But if I said to you, you should eat this banana because you've got an exam tomorrow and tonight it'll give you a little bit of an energy boost that'll help you study a little bit more. Maybe your chances of eating it have gone up a little bit. Or if I said to you, eat this banana because it'll give you a boost tonight in your football game, assuming that you play football. Maybe you'll eat the banana. So it's actually not about the banana at all. It's about what the banana can do for you. It's about the role that banana plays in your particular life according to your particular priorities. If you're trying to lose weight, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to convince you to eat a whole piece of cheesecake. You might want to, but it's not going to help you achieve your objective. So what I'm trying to say with this example is that if we're going to bring nutrition to non-nutrition communities, we have to break down the barriers of how we talk about it. We have to talk about nutrition not in its own terms, but in the way that people re relate to and can understand. Then we start getting somewhere. Now, I'm a passionate actor and musical theatre performer. Um, my, my colleagues know this and all my friends know it. It's impossible to hide. And I took uh, a leap of faith back in 2012. I applied to and got into a full-time uh, master's degree in musical theatre in London. And um, apart from teaching us how to talk like the Queen and so on, they also taught us how to act. And there are some things that I learnt there that have helped me in my business life. And I remember when I came back to my company, and I was um, currently interviewing for the role that I have now, one of our senior interviewers said to me, Anthony, you took a year off. I said, yeah. He said, to study what? I said, I did a master's degree. In what? Uh, uh, an MA, Master of Arts. Uh, oh, communications. No, musical theater. <laughs> and you could see he stopped for a second. He looked at me and he said, what on earth has that got to do with your job here? This business, career, nutrition. And that question has stuck with me from that day until now. And there are some interesting parallels that I can draw between trying to get nutrition into another environment and how acting has helped me in my work in business and in nutrition. And I'll give you two examples of those. In acting, if any of you have ever done any acting on, in theatre or film, TV, 
you'll know that one of the things you have to do is stay in the present moment all the time. Even though you've rehearsed the scene a million times and you may be bored of it, you have to do it like it's the first time you've ever done it. You have to engage and be present with the person opposite you and engage and dance with them in real time. But at the same time, you have to stand at a distance and watch yourself interacting because as an actor, you always go into a scene with an objective to get something, to achieve something, to progress something. So if your interaction isn't working, you have to modify what you're doing to be able to get your objective achieved. It's the same in nutrition. If we're going to bring that story outside of nutrition and talk about the economics of it, we have to engage with those stakeholders in a way that, that is completely real, true and genuine. Listen to them. And if it's not working, the message we're getting across, we have to think of another way. We have to adapt ourselves and watch that environment constantly. And that skill of watching yourself as you are actually performing your convincing role or your message getting across is really, really valuable. And the other one, and I'm very guilty of this, you might be performing a beautiful monologue and you forget your lines. <laughs> it's awkward. <laughs> you can't just not speak. You can't just, one minute I've forgotten my lines. What's my line? You can't do that. And if you're with someone on the stage, it's funny because you see them ever so slightly, their eyes get bigger and bigger and bigger and they look at you as if to say, you're ruining this moment, my mother is in the audience. You have to improvise, you have to find another way around. You have to adapt to that environment that you have actually just created. And it's exactly the same in nutrition and in fact it's applicable elsewhere. We're going to be throwing ourselves into the unknown when I go and talk to someone who's allocating millions of funding to programs and it's between nutrition and education and infrastructure, I have to talk to him in a way that is going to be probably different to how I've ever done it before. I have to find a way to adapt to that environment and it's always going to be the challenge. So we have to get comfortable with doing things differently and, and changing the way we do things. I have a perfect example that is applicable to my business of nutrition right here in Singapore that I can share with you. Last year we were contacted by a wonderful social entrepreneur who we know because he'd read about the migrant construction worker population here in Singapore. It's 300,000 plus people. He read an article about their diets, what they get when they go to work, the lack of the nutrition in that diet, and how they themselves were suffering as a result. Their nutritional status, their health was actually suffering. So we had a conversation with him and he said, guys, how can we, how can we improve their nutrition? So we provide nutrition solutions. So we said, oh, we've got all these amazing ideas for you. We can fortify the rice with vitamins and minerals and correct any deficiencies that they have and it'll make them healthier and they'll feel better and they'll be more productive and it's great. Okay, cool. He gets nutrition, so no problem at all. But now we have to take this solution and this story, firstly to the construction workers themselves and convince them that this fortified rice that we want to put into their diets is firstly good, acceptable, and it's relevant for them. And if I go and say, you must eat this rice, it's got vitamins and minerals. They'd be like, well, firstly, what are those? Or who cares? Or um, go away. But if I say, eating this will help you get, will feel better, feel stronger, you'll be sick less often, and talk to them in a way that they understand, suddenly it's relevant for them. But that was the easy part. The harder part was more engaging construction companies who have these hundreds and thousands of workers on site every single day. The conversation goes something like this. We want to help you make your workers more nourished and healthier. Because if they're healthier workers, they will be more productive. If they're healthier workers as well, they'll have less off sick days. If they're healthier and more productive workers, that means that they get the job done better. That also means they get the job done probably quicker. And that means your job building is done more efficiently. And that is good business. You can save time, you can save cost. That's good business. We suddenly engage with those construction companies in a way that they understand and they care about. And the bonus is they have a healthier workforce, so they can actually feel good about doing something that's really relevant for that workforce. So that project is now in scale. It's called 45 Rice. It's a social, it's a social business. And we are starting to ramp it up right now. And I'm really excited because we have, we have a big dream. We want to reach every single construction worker in Singapore with those solutions and build them out even more. And we want to take that example to other cities, other developed cities around the world. Because guess what? Malnutrition is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's not just in developing countries, emerging e economies, third world countries, the global south. It's everywhere. Nutrition 
is everybody's problem, and malnutrition is as well. So, a closing message. Whether it's nutrition or it's something else that's closer to your hearts, if we're going to change the impact that nutrition, the enabling impact we know that it can have, it's up to us, those who know and care so much about it, to take that story, find ways to make it relevant to stakeholders who have power, who have abilities to influence, and allow nutrition to have the impact that we know that it can have. We're taking it into the unknown. It's called the unknown because it is unknown. But we can be adaptable, we can consider who those stakeholders are and we can find ways to talk to them in a different way. Have the guts to do things differently. Have the guts to reshape the role nutrition can play. It's hard to understand, so let's make it understandable. I have a dream that one day a mega celebrity, Oprah would be great if she ever sees this, a mega celebrity, someone who has got credibility, clout, and millions and millions of followers all around the world, that they take on nutrition as their personal ambassador mission. That they stand up and they say, I'm going to use my power to talk about nutrition. Because we have so many celebrities who adopt so many wonderful causes today. And we can think of m so many examples. And there are a lot of nutrition supporters and a lot of advocates for nutrition. I'm one of them, but nobody knows me. So I'm looking for Oprah or Michelle Obama, or I, it can be Beyonce, I don't really care. It has to be someone strong and powerful, believable, who is a force to be reckoned with and can take that nutrition message and help us spread it beyond the nutrition community. Because if we do that, the enabling potential is unleashed, and children like Timber and millions of others like him around the world will have a chance to have a future in which their entire physical cognitive potential is untapped. And in a single generation, we will be able to change the productivity and the prosperity of the world. Thank you very much.